it's eight o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll just have people rotate up um, as we're speaking. Um, and then um, for those of you that are here, I, I'm appreciative of you coming at this early morning hour, despite you not being in costume, nor us, though we're gonna put that in our feedback that we should do that for next year. Um, briefly, uh, my name is uh, Mike Ward. I'm at the Nashville VA as well as uh, Vanderbilt, I'm an emergency physician, so associate professor and research director, um, and um, we'll do brief introductions. Um, but I just realized as we were all talking here that we're all um, recently funded um, from HSRD as well. Um, so um, this is what we're going to talk about today in terms of submitting your research to the VA. So, Keith, um, let's use the microphone because I think that this is recorded. Um, yeah, so I'm Keith Coker. I am a emergency physician and researcher at University of Michigan and at the Ann Arbor VA, uh, located there, part of the COIN, so the, we're in the Center for um, Innovation there. And um, it, just a little bit about my bio, because I think it'll be helpful here for context. So I'm kind of mid-career investigator, health services researcher, who really only in the last two years have migrated some of my work to the VA. So it can come from that kind of context as we start talking about things and why I did that um, and also what I learned along the way. Good morning, my name is Anita Vashi. I work at the Palo Alto Coin. I've been there for about uh, 10 years um, and I'm a full-time VA person, although I do also work per diem at San Francisco General. Um, so I guess my situation is a little bit different than Keith and I'm happy to speak to that. I've really only ever applied to VA funding um, and so uh, and many different types of funding, so I can talk about that a little bit if that's of interest. Um, and my research tends to deal with veteran access to emergency care in and outside the VA and program evaluation of things not related to emergency care. Good morning, I'm Justine Seidenfeld. I'm an emergency medicine physician at the Durham VA and also with the Durham VA COIN. Um, I am an early career researcher. I just finished a fellowship um, at the VA and, and Duke University and then transitioned to a position at the, at the Durham VA. Excellent, so I think we have really nice representation of VA research here. Try to get a little less feedback. Let's see if that works a little better. So I think we have really nice representation here, um, and um, what we'll do, uh, we have no disclosures, um, is talk a little bit about um, how to get started in VA emergency care research, how to prepare an application for submission. We're primarily going to talk about HSRD, though um, we'll give you a little better idea of what the structure of the Office of Research and Development looks like, even though changes are coming. Um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about the distinctions between submitting NIH research uh, versus the VA, um, and then some of the other mechanisms that exist that uh, you may not see elsewhere. Uh, so this is our agenda. We'll talk a little bit about the broader veteran emergency care population, preparing your applications, um, and uh, we'll try to have enough time for Q&A as well. So some background, there's really been a fairly rapid transition of uh, VA emergency care um, over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, since 2007, the number of emergency medicine board certified physicians has dramatically increased from about 16% uh, to more than 55% in 2022. The number of facilities with uh, their own dedicated emergency medicine service has gone from less than 10% to now about a third. Um, and this is uh, for 139 facilities. I am gonna frequently reference the special issue in academic emergency medicine. The QR code here will allow you to be able to access that directly and it's currently open access uh, for the next say month and a half or so. But um, if you can get it through your uh, medical center as well, then you should be able to also access it there. VA emergency care provides uh, um, care for a fairly large and diverse population. So there are about 3 million annual emergency department visits, both within the VA as well as outside. So about two thirds of those occur uh, within uh, the VA system. 
Um, and then emergency care is the single largest uh, category of VA community care as part of the Mission Act. In 2021, it was nearly $7 billion. Now this includes um, the hospital care resulting from this as well, uh, but the costs from this continue to climb. And as many of you know, especially if you currently work in the VA or do any sort of government work, um, there is a fairly substantial alphabet soup. We'll do our best to define these, uh, but even sometimes they get tripped up. Uh, for example, cider. <laughs> I looked that up and I'm still, uh, I'll, I'll see how well I can do with it today. Um, so the VA Office of Research and Development in its current structure, or ORD, has multiple different services. Health Services, Research and Development, HSRD, that's one that um, I sit on a study section with. Um, Anita's reviewed for before, um, and I think all of us are funded through. Um, clinical Science Research and Development, CSRD, that's more of your uh, typical clinical trial. Uh, BLRD, that's going to be more of your basic science. Um, there's a uh, rehabilitation service, and then there are multiple other programs as well uh, in the VA. Um, this QR code will take you directly to ORD's website. <clears throat> so the purpose of HSRD is to support research that really encompasses all aspects of VA healthcare, uh, primarily focusing on uh, patient care, cost, and quality. Uh, their mission is to identify, evaluate, and rapidly implement evidence-based strategies that improve the quality and safety of care delivered to veterans. I think that really resonates with a lot of us and the type of research that we're doing. And probably most of what uh, we're interested in will fall into HSRD. They're very much like AHRQ. I almost like to think of them as like AHRQ with money. Um, HSRD also supports multiple centers and research networks. So uh, Keith mentioned the COINS or the Centers of Innovation. This is when you have a critical mass of researchers, typically around um, five. So that can include pilot, CDA, or uh, career development award, and merits. You, can, you are then eligible to apply that, which then uh, provides you additional funds and resources. Um, so I believe we have the Palo Alto, um, Ann Arbor has one, is that right? Durham has one. Um, ours does not. <laughs> we, keep, we keep getting to five and then we just miss it. Um, and then I think that's it that's represented here. <clears throat> but um, I think there are, what, 11 coins is what, somewhere around there nationally. Um, and they all have sort of a different flavor um, of what uh, they particularly, uh, what they emphasize. Um, there's also a query uh, or the Quality Enhancement Research Initiative, which will focus more on uh, um, implementation and uh, dissemination. And there are resource centers like HERC, Virex, CIDR, and Vinci, uh, which can focus on uh, economic analysis, informatics, and uh, information dissemination and education research. <laughs> Cider. <laughs> I was struggling with that one yesterday. There's also a career development plan, a program that we'll talk a little bit about with uh, Dr. Seidenfeld. Um, they also oversee the VA cyber seminar series, which is wonderful if you're trying to gain familiarity with particular uh, data sets or methods or populations. We've done several um, on VA emergency care in the past. And it's a nice way um, to be able to go to their catalog and to be able to rapidly catch up. Um, and then there are also the state-of-the-art conferences um, of which we participated and led the uh, SAVE um, or state-of-the-art conference in VA emergency medicine recently and is in the special issue on academic emergency medicine. So my slides will wrap up with the HSRD priorities. So you'll notice in the bottom um, square slash rectangle, um, that emergency medicine has now been added as a result of the state-of-the-art conference. However, um, there's a broad array of priorities. So we talked about these yesterday in one of our other didactics, and is um, uh, from the QR code here, you can get directly to these priorities in the academic emergency medicine issue. Um, but they range from access to equity, women's health, mental health, um, and so, um, you can read more about the details of these um, within um, their RFA. 
Um, they also include cross-cutting methods such as translational research, implementation, improvement science, engagement, and then there are also legislative priorities. One you'll frequently hear about is the Mission Act, which enhances access to non-VA care, but there are other um, uh, legislative priorities like the CARES Act, um, and then they're in the PACT Act as well, which I am not as familiar with. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bashi. Okay, so just for a little bit of context, um, speak a little bit about some of the populations that uh, VA focuses on. Um, so especially for our ED populations, um, as probably many of you know, about over half of our ED visits are made by veterans, which are um, older than 65. And mental health and substance use visits are one of the leading um, reasons for VA ED visits, and so therefore a priority. Um, and as Mike was uh, mentioning earlier, um, you know, VA provided care is just a, a portion of, of a care that veterans receive. You know, a lot of veterans don't live close to one of the 110 EDs when acute and scheduled needs arise, so many veterans visit non-VA ED visits that the VA pays for. And so these three areas were our priority areas for that recent uh, state-of-the-art conference um, and are the priority areas within the emergency medicine priority. And uh, here, this kind of um, outlines again our state-of-the-art conference, which was organized by those three priority areas. And as from that uh, conference, we developed research and policy recommendations. It's essentially like a blueprint of the most pressing research and policy questions we have in each of those three areas. So if anyone's interested in doing VA research, that's a great place to start and see where um, most of the interest is. So just, uh, just to ask, how many folks here have um, submitted VA proposals or have applied for VA funding? Anyone here? Okay. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the differences between how VA is a little bit different from other uh, funding sources. So usually we have two submission dates. There's a winter cycle and a summer cycle. Um, a couple months before that deadline, there's something called the, the ITS or the intention to submit. Essentially, the only thing that can't change from that is the title of your proposal, um, and I think maybe that's about it, actually. What's that? Yeah, maybe the PI. Um, but um, it's just a good way to sort of like help, help them organize, you know, how the sections are going to be organized and who's going to be reviewing. Um, and then funding for grants is a little bit different in that we can't use VA funding to pay for physician time. Um, uh, and, and we can get into that a little bit later, of what that means for um, uh, investigators that are trying to get their funding time covered, especially when you work in two different systems. Um, there's, like, as Mike mentioned, there's both a pilot uh, mechanism, which has a bit of a shorter application, about nine pages, and for the IIRs, those are a bit long, like a more full proposal, three to four years, um, with about 14 pages. I think a big difference between VA and non-VA research is the emphasis on having operational support, which is something that I really appreciate. It's this idea that, you know, there is an end user for your research. And so I think it's, these days it's almost imperative to have an uh, operational partner for your research. Um, and that's usually demonstrated through either your work with them or at the, at the minimum a letter of support, which all operational partners are very um, used to doing and comfortable doing as long as you kind of engage them early on. Um, you know, uh, adding the veteran perspective is also really important. I think these days almost everyone in some capacity um, includes veteran engagement. Um, most of the COINs have a veteran and family council, so we often um, engage with them and we're just brainstorming our aims, get some feedback. I've been able to work with our veteran family council on a lot of different things from proposal development to um, developing a code book for qualitative work to some of the veterans on the council um, volunteering to be uh, kind of pilot interviews for our code book to sort of test that out. So it's been really great. And then we often go back and um, disseminate our results to them as well. Um, and then another big um, uh, key point that we'll talk a little bit about is eligibility and requiring a VA appointment to apply for VA funding. So the requirement is a PI should be an MD, PhD, or equivalent. Um, and then it requires a VA paid appointment. 
And the VA, for those of you that may not be familiar, it works in something called eighths. So I myself as a 100% VA person am eight eighths VA. And so it's essentially like percent time, right? Like, so I'm 100% VA. And the minimum um, required for uh, PI is five eighths VA. Uh, there are instances where you can apply for funding with less than five eighths, and that requires um, a waiver. And I think Keith, you've gone, you've applied for funding that route. So if that's, if folks have questions about that, I think we can speak to how you go about that and how that works. <clears throat> um, the VA also requires that medical centers have an active research program for you to be able to apply. I think that's just to sort of ensure that there's support available at your institution. And I think you know. Obviously, if you're affiliated with a COIN, that definitely makes life a lot easier. There's a lot of resources available to you. But I think VA increasingly recognizes that there are investigators at smaller places and centers um, that uh, can do great research. So I think there are, they've recognized in trying to make it more, um, reduce the kind of barrier to entry for places, for investigators that are affiliated uh, with non COINs. And so our funding mechanisms, um, the, the two major ones through HSR and D would be, uh, or the three would be the Career Development Award, which Justine is going to speak a bit about, um, the pilot funding, which is generally a two-year uh, uh, award, and then the merit awards, which come with a larger budget and are three to four years in length. And then uh, from time to time, uh, HSR and D also puts out something called an SDR, so Service Directed Research. So that's when they have a you know, instead of it being an investigator-initiated idea, it's something that the VA um, is really interested in, and so they're seeking researchers to come and evaluate. So, for example, they'll say, you know, we have um, uh, recently one that uh, we, we, we are doing right now, actually, is for disrupted care due to COVID. So they said, we want to better understand, you know, what is excess mortality with veterans uh, due to COVID? What are, what are some of the consequences of the disruptions in care for procedures, for uh, primary care, et cetera? And so uh, anyone can apply to that, um, and sometimes those are a little bit off cycle, and it can be a little bit of a different application process, but it also goes through review um, similarly to the other grants. And I'll pass it over to Justine. Um, so VA Career Development Awards, uh, I believe they're fairly similar to K awards. They fund early career researchers for about three to five years. Um, if you are affiliated with a COIN, they give you uh, research support or supplemental support funds for about 40,000 per year um, if you're at a COIN. And then if you're not at a COIN, a little bit more with uh, 50,000 per year. I think there's a couple differences from um, some of the other awards in that I believe for career de development awards, you don't actually initially need to have a VA appointment. You need to just have a letter from the director saying that if you get the career development award, they will give you um, an appointment. And I think one of the other big differences from VA career development awards and, and K's is that there's no salary cap. So this is actually, I think, the only type of award where, as the PI, you do get salary um, support anywhere up to 75% or six-eighths of your salary. So that is um, a very nice advantage of the career development award at the VA. Um, I'll also just speak to, on occasion, they offer sort of another version of a career development award, which is what I'm going to be doing. It's a mentored physician scientist award, and those are offered across all of the service lines. So it's not just um, health services health services research. It's also open to basic clinical uh, rehab service lines. So the funding amounts are a little bit higher because basically they offer the same amount for all of those service lines. So it, it is a little bit higher than the typical um, HSR&D career development award, which is also kind of a nice, a nice bonus. And then uh, talk about pilots. Yeah, so I'm just gonna cover a couple topics here <clears throat> on some grant mechanisms that were already mentioned a little bit by um, Anita. Um, and certainly, just uh, when it gets to the panel session, certainly I can happily speak about you know what it meant for me to start at a lower effort, um, even though 
it does require moving to that five eighths effort when you get a, an award, uh, as Anita mentioned. So the first one here is um, a pilot award. I mean, I coming from the outside environments or NIH context, AHRQ context, this is basically like an R21, um, where it gives you, in this case, up to $200,000 to do 18 months of work. Uh, you get one resubmission, but it's to generate pilot data, um, proof of concept, um, to build the foundation for a bigger award, uh, like a merit. Um, and then this is, uh, again, coming from the outside context, equivalent to like an R01. Uh, so this is the VA's R01. Um, Merit Award, also called an IIR, Investigator Initiated Research. Um, you know, as uh, Anita was mentioning, uh, the budget caps at $1.2 million. I think from the outside that feels small, um, but it doesn't include, um, as Anita was mentioning, uh, budgeting for like the physician investigator side of things. And it doesn't include indirects either. So that's part of the reason the budget may feel smaller. Um, but it still is allows you to really legitimately do the work that you need to do over the course of, again, here up to four years. Um, and then a little bit of a difference, too, from coming from the outside is you actually get one more resubmission. Um, so you get three cracks at it as, a, as opposed to more the standard two uh, that you may be more familiar with. Um, so that's all I got. I think, Mike, you're up next. So as we mentioned before, there are the service-directed awards. Um, there can also be, um, and I think Anita has one of these, the Partner Center of Evidence-Based Policy uh, Resource, uh, Resource Center Awards. And then um, I have funding from the Office of Rural Health, so this might be more in the form of, say, quality improvement. That's not something that you typically see outside of the VA. Um, you know, a lot of the quality improvement work that we're doing um, outside of the VA tends to be unfunded. Um, there's also uh, from the Office of Women's Health, Mental Health. Now, not all offices have money. For example, the Office of Emergency Medicine, um, although they're, they're trying to get some, but uh, sometimes they may be more uh, uh, a concentrated group of people with, have, with a particular interest in an area or expertise in an area. Uh, here, the funding rates tends to be around 20 to 25 percent. Sorry, it's a little small, um, but um, uh, so you can look at those that were um, submitted, streamlined, or basically triaged, and then those that were funded. Now, this includes um, all comers, uh, depending upon how uh, uh, how many, um, uh, or sorry, what number submission this was. Um, and so I tried to include here uh, for different cycles to give you a sense of the spread. So depending upon the number of applications and how early on they are, um, uh, you may have a lower funding rate like you see with the pilots there. Um, and this is all publicly available on the VA's website as well. So some other notable tips, we already talked about the clinician salaries. Keith brings up a great point about uh, clinician salaries not being included. There are also services like the Centralized Transcription Service Program, where they will actually do the transcription, say, in a sort of qualitative work. And this is done out of the Denver VA? Salt Lake. Salt Lake, that's right, that's right. So, um, um, and you can get a quote from them and include them if you don't have transcription resources. There's also a limit on non-IPA, non or non-VA researchers called IPAs, and it depends upon whether or not you're in a coin. And so what that means is if I'm at the Nashville VA, um, I may want a particular uh, expert on my team that I may not have at the Nashville VA. So I bring them in from Vanderbilt, they're considered an IPA. And so I have to limit how much from the standpoint of my salary or uh, how much uh, salary on my grant is actually included from an IPA. Um, and they'll calculate the overall percentage of this. Now, there are ways to get around this through contracting where it's not actually considered an IPA, um, but just know that the hard cap on IPAs exists and it's dependent upon whether or not you're at a coin. Um, it's really important having reviewed a number of HSRD grants that you demonstrate familiarity with data and it's rel in your relevance of your research to, to veterans. Some people think that they can just take their R01 
and then translate it over, and it does not <laughs> read well. You really have to customize this. This is not like going from you know NINDS to NHLBI. Um, it, it really has to read as if uh, it's important for veterans and why. And then on top of that, what's your familiarity with data? Uh, because a lot of these reviewers know these data, databases inside and out, and they will pick it apart and they can tell if, uh, if you're making this up or you've, if you've never really looked into these databases or used them before. You have to have a center director letter. Um, now, you don't necessarily have to have five A's um, unless you have uh, a, a waiver. Typically, there's the promise of five A's if you're funded, and that's something that comes through in the center director letter. That'd be kind of like a chairman's letter, um, but a center director tends to be fair, uh, higher than, say, your own chairman would be uh, for an NIH grant. Um, and then some of the information that's available, for example, some of the RFAs are only available behind the VA firewall. So if you don't have a VA appointment and you're trying to think about this, it gets harder and harder. A bunch of the information is available on HSRD and ORD's website, but, um, but not everything. Um, so how do you get started? Submitting grant is one thing, but key is really starting with an academic affi affiliation and, and you may be at a site that doesn't have an academic affiliate. It's gonna be really challenging <laughs> to try to do any sort of research in that case. But if you have an academic affiliate and um, there are a number nationally, um, being able to leverage that resource is probably your best bet. Um, Next, I would recommend working clinically, if you're possible, if you can, to try to understand in the environment um, some of the nuances of the care and the challenges that the veterans experience. Um, and also recognize that if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. It's kind of like any emergency department, right? Um, there are gonna be unique challenges of that VA that don't always generalize, but there are many things in terms of how uh, the VA itself is structured that you can scale what you're doing locally. Um, you just have to keep in mind other resources, policies um, available that enable you to do so. This work really can't be done alone. Uh, there are a number of existing centers uh, throughout um, the VA. So COINS that we mentioned, GREC is another one, the Geriatric Resource Education Center, <laughs> basically for geriatric veterans. Um, so, for example, Nashville does not have a COIN, but it has a GREC. Um, there's Query, Office of Rural Health. There are other resources that are available. The key is continue looking um, if, um, uh, if your site doesn't necessarily have the typical resources that you would expect. I mentioned cyber seminars earlier. That's a great way to get started. They're also publicly available. Um, we have a monthly VA emergency medicine research call on the fourth Thursday at 12 Eastern. If you're interested, just let me know and I can get you on that. Um, or any, anyone here who knows how to get a hold of me, just reach out and I can get it for you. Um, and then uh, we had a networking event at this um, and we'll just continue. Uh, you know, Anita and I started this 10 years ago um, and um, it just continues to grow. Our call continues to um, include more people um, and the whole goal of that call is really just help each other, vet research, how do you get it done, um, and uh, really trying to grow this VA emergency medicine uh, community. So with that, um, I wanted to leave enough time that we had for uh, questions um, and um, anything that's on your mind in terms of how to get started in VA emergency medicine research. I think there was actually one point too that I wanted to bring up about the um, uh, CDAs. So um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you are, um, if you get a CDA, you are not eligible for the loan repayment program on the NIH side, but the VA has a smaller loan repayment program. Um, it's if you're eight A's, um, you're not eligible for the NIH loan repayment program. So that's an important nuance. There are, um, there is some more flexibility though. Um, by doing the CDA, I think in terms of how you financially structure it, um, that people don't always appreciate too. Go ahead, Jim. Um, letter oh. of intent, is it like PCORI where only a select number of applications are reviewed and approved, or is it 
like you said, just a way to kind of organize your study section. So I, I guess what's the, are there other intents of the LOI, like triaging and kind of narrowing down how many applications are in the so I'll summarize the question, and then maybe uh, Anita, you want to sure. answer it. Um, and, and I'm summarizing it, summarizing it just because it's being recorded. But the question was um, whether or not the LOI um, can be rejected, or if it's more of a uh, just a uh, traditional process. So that's a great question. Um, so the the ITS for like the IARs and pilots is just like a logistical kind of administrative thing, but for CDAs, they can triage based on your letter of intent. I think some of the smaller awards too, sometimes they can um, they can also do that, but it, it those are just depending upon the individual mechanism. So the question is um, asking about the physician salary caps. Is that? Well, yeah, the budgets include that portion. So are you saying they don't fund it? Which I don't think yeah. That's what you're yeah. Yeah. Let's. We should clarify for sure. Yeah. I was like. So it's just should, a clarification of the. Especially from, from the outside, that's like that doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. It's so. Um, I may need some help here. It's covered in other mechanisms effectively. Um, so you still get the effort for the the actual work of the grant if you are awarded the grant. Um, it's just not included in the line item budgets for that grant itself. Um, and so those eights that you're working on that grant, for example, for me, are basically covered within this coin that I'm part of. Um, and so I don't know, sir, how the funds actually flow to sort of deal with that problem. Um, but it's not that you aren't now having any effort for that grant. So Maybe I can some clarification. Yeah, I can shed a little bit of light on that too. So the the traditional expectation is that you get three eighths for a merit. Um, I didn't know that until the third round that I submitted. I'm like putting in random percentages, and uh, and then one of my colleagues is like, "Oh yeah, no, it's three eighths." Okay, so you you have a particular amount of effort um, that does not go into the budget. However. Um, your medical center then provides those eighths to you. The reason they're able to do that is because then the VERA dollars come from central office to your medical center that get allocated as part of that. Those are kind of like indirects. Um, so it's, um, the funding is there um, for you. It just isn't in your budget explicitly for you. The other thing to keep in mind is that eighths are not necessarily additive. So for example, if you got um, two merits, um, supposedly with three A's each, you, that doesn't mean you have six A's. Um, it's, it can be a bit more complicated and nuanced than that, um, but, uh, and especially part of the goal is that you will have at least five A's if you're a merit-funded investigator. Anita, you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll just say that it's not like your eights kind of go flex up or down based on what you're applying to, right? Like I'm eight eights VA if I don't have a grant for a year, it's not like I lose my eights or something like that. It's not something that can be taken away from you. Um, uh, so I, I, it's hard for me to compare it to the outside, but you know, when you're actually like writing your budget, it's just like physician time donated. And so I think you have to sort of work out something with your center on how your time is covered between the clinical service and the, whoever is, is like your, wherever your research home is. And that's usually a negotiation and I think like, like Mike said that, you know, usually if you've gotten a CDA and you're applying for a merit, or you know, I didn't do a CDA, I didn't go the CDA route, but um, at that point you're usually five eights covered by researchers. Somehow, somehow those eights have to get to you, and that's usually a negotiation between uh, the research director and maybe like the, the cheapest, uh, it's called the ACOS, it's like a VA term, the associate chief of staff. Um, they can kind of give out aids for different things. So, so ours is a little bit different. So it de it depends on who the service chief yeah. is, um, and I don't think our ACOS gives out any ace actually. Um, the other thing, um, and so you're eight eights, so that's a bit of a different flavor. Whereas if you're more of a hybrid, it can in fact go away. So, um, so if I'm no longer funded, then I may not have those aids. 
Um, but it's it doesn't follow quite like NIH. Like if you know my 10% effort ends on June 30th, that means as of July 1, I no longer have that effort. It's slower than that. Um, it, you know, it may be slower to start and it may be slower to end. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The other nuance is um, co-investigators. Um, so if you're a physician, you can't budget for them, but if they're a co-investigator, how do you get them effort? Um, and the way that we've found to be able to do that is A, your research needs to be approved as research. I know it sounds kind of silly, but sometimes if you're doing implementation, they have a, the IRB can have a much broader definition of what is in fact QI and not necessarily research. So A, it needs to be considered research. Um, and B, this is where negotiating with your service chief or your ACOS ahead of time is really important to say, if Dr. Hahn is funded as a co-investigator, I'd like to include him with an aid. Um, and then that way, you know, especially if you have probably two submissions um, on average, then you can plan for that. It gives the service line enough time to be able to allocate that particular eighth. If you come back and say, guess what, I got this funding, probably not going to get it, would be my guess, at least at our shop. Any other nuances that you all have found in terms of submitting research? Is the turnaround the same, similar, quicker, longer? Keith, do you want to talk about yours? And that's the, what's the turnaround time for uh, funding once you've gotten it? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in the middle, I think, of that experience right now, and you and I are. Um, so there is this just-in-time process, similar to what you might experience from other kinds of grant mechanisms, uh, like NIH. It's probably more prolonged um, in the VA. Um, it, to be very specific about it, um, you have like 180 days, so six months to get all your materials together. Things like refresh of budget, uh, IRB approvals, a lot of certain sort of administrative tasks, um, and then uh, eventually you get. A, assuming you sort of go through that, get through that process, you get a start date. Um, but my sense is it's kind of a six to nine month process once you've heard that you've been favorably reviewed and they're interested in funding it. Um, and that feels longer to me than like what I might have experienced through say NIH. However, I will say that the turnaround time in terms of your actual score is a lot faster. That's fair. Um, yeah. So um, we submitted our A1 for a pilot in December, um, and we knew in March what our score was, had comments a couple weeks later, um, and then a few weeks after that had a notice of intent to fund. Um, and most likely, so if you think about December is when that A1 submission was, we'll probably start in October coinciding with the fiscal year. Um, is that typical from a start point for you guys too. Mine have seemed to start in October. I don't know if that's. I think it's so variable. Um, like it depends what's happening with the VA budgets too. Like in my last IAR, um, the funding time was actually really fast. I think it was within like three to four months. Uh, we got our funds and our start date was May 1st. So it was random middle of the year start. Um, sometimes that's when they're trying to offload their dollars before the end of the fiscal year. Um, and it depends on a few things, too, like if you're working with an existing IRB already, you've gone through the IRB process, um, so that might make it a little faster for you, things like that. The just-in-time process is up to 180 days, um, and it's different than um, submitting an NIH. You have to, you know, so you have to do a fairly revised budget. And I've gotten multiple iterations on that. And then you have to do something called a quad chart, um, which is almost like a poster of your um, grant with a timeline and figure. Fortunately, we include figures of our overall overview of our aims. So I'm like, here you go. <laughs> um, so that's really helpful. Justine, do you want to talk at all about, um, I don't know if you submitted a K, um, but your decision not to submit a K um, and just go CDA route? Um, I think for me it was just, oh. 
Yeah, I, I did not submit a K, um, but I think for me it was more a function of kind of, you know, just where my mentorship was, where I wanted to build my career, um, you know, through, I think, at least for me as a, a National Clinician Scholars Program Fellow, I had had, you know, now like two years of experience working with people in the VA system, and it built up relationships with people not only at my home base, Durham VA, but also, you know, the Palo Alto VA at, at Michigan, and, and so just kind of largely based on the mentorship and the work I had already been doing and the opportunities, you know, especially with this very particular grant mechanism that I went for, um, I just ended up very happily deciding to, to submit a, a VA CDA. Yeah, and I did a K. Keith, you did a K, and Anita, you did a none. Anita didn't need it. <laughs> um, and, and I actually submitted both a K and a CDA. Um, and um, the funny part was when I submitted my K, um, after I was working, so I had different mentors because it was just such a different environment. Um, and when I submitted my uh, CDA, my VA mentor found a fatal flaw in my K, completely <laughs> revised it and then submitted my K again, and then that got funded, and my CDA got really close. Um, so I just went with the K. But I was always kind of like, God, I, you know, like the VA is just so much con more conducive to the type of research that I do. One other thing I just realized that we didn't um, mention is another way to get your foot in the door with VA funding, and that's um, the VA is increasingly using supplements to sort of encourage um, early career investigators and especially to support DEI initiatives. And um, uh, and it's a great mechanism where, like, if you're a PI and you have an existing merit, you can apply to get some supplemental funds to help an early career person kind of develop an offshoot project from yours that comes with some um, decent-sized funding. And I think it's a great opportunity and one that I often wished I could, you know, uh, bring to folks, but we just don't have a lot of early folk, uh, early career folks at our at our center or like the pipeline to sort of build up a more diverse uh, research uh, group, so. That's a good point. Um, and then I guess we didn't really discuss that. Um, there are still mechanisms to apply for like foundation funding outside of VA funds, so for, um, I don't know if it's just at COINS, but I think a couple COINS at least have these sort of non-profit, yeah, aff mm -hmm. yep. yeah, affiliated entities that kind of facilitate um, non-VA funding. And so, for example, like I applied for an EMF um, grant last year um, that was sort of administratively coordinated through through that group, but it was, you know, a very helpful kind of organization. So. There are also good opportunities for non-VA funding, which is worth mentioning. Are there issues around indirects with that? Do you know? I, I believe it was that the, at least for this particular grant, the indirect rates were l lower than what the nonprofit typically like to do, but there was You some, mean zero? <laughs> not quite, but close. But um, at least for me, with my center director, we managed to kind of negotiate um, to, to move forward with the application. It's probably one of those things, just knowing it ahead of time and preventing problems is helpful. One other thing I'll add to is, again, since my research is only at the VA, this is just what I hear, but um, I think that we tend to be a lot more collaborative in VA than perhaps outside the VA. Um, for example, a lot of opportunities for me, especially early on, came because my center director knows all the other center directors. and. Um, kind of facilitated some introductions, kind of knowing kind of behind the scenes that maybe two groups were going to be applying for the same SDR and got us together and we collaborated in, in because the VA really supports like multiple PIs. Um, so I got to, you know, be a multiple PI on something with someone a lot more experienced that was not at my center. Um, so those kind of opportunities, people know each other, like all the center directors know each other really well um, and there's so much cross-center collaboration. Um, it's really encouraged within the VA, so it's really nice. Final questions? Feel free to reach out to any of us. We're happy to chat, um, and thank you all for coming.